happy holidays everybody it's Michelle from Tape and Twine and I'm here to do the December edition of tea with me as you can see I do not have tea today I have coffee because I am exhausted as most of us are this time of year and I just need a little pick-me-up this afternoon um, hopefully the lighting's okay it's kind of getting a little darker but I didn't want to put on the overhead light and have all sorts of reflection so I'm quickly going to tell you what we're going to talk about today um, that way you can fast forward to the parts you want or I hope you'll just make a nice cup of something coffee tea cocoa and hang with me for a while because I have some interesting things to share with you today I'm going to show you a few decorations that I've made out of polymer clay I will be discussing my um, monthly book review, uh, a recommendation of an antique book that you can probably find online that can give you inspiration or materials for your paper craft. I am going to also share some information that I've been learning about postcards so that you can help uh, better identify types of postcards and which ones have value and don't have value because as paper crafters we certainly don't want to destroy something that has inherent value so I've been trying to learn more and more about which things I can and can't cut and which things I might want to incorporate in a pocket of my journal and preserve so I'm going to be going going over types of postcards with you I have a really exciting scrapbook that I just obtained, um, a Victorian scrapbook that's probably, I, I think I dated it around 100 years old, maybe 90 years old that I wanted to share with you. And then the last thing I want to do today is share a couple letters that I found from 99 years ago at Christmas time by two pen pals, um, one in France, one in the United States, and I thought it'd be a lovely way to end to read those letters. So, let's get started. First, I'm gonna take a sip. And I'm gonna tell you guys how much I've missed you. I've really, really wanted to make videos, and I've been having real issues with time, as we all do this time of year. But also I'm having issue, issues with storage, which has not allowed me to make videos recently. And unfortunately, I had really wanted to make videos working in my Christmas journal every, um, every week, and that has not happened. One, again, because of time, and two, because I don't have storage room to be able to uh, upload them and edit them and then and then bring them to YouTube. I'm gonna have to figure out a better way to get some stuff out of my iCloud so that I can um, start making longer videos again. So I apologize for not being able to get to that. I really had wanted to, but you know, these things happen and in the future I'll try really hard not to make promises I can't keep. But anyway, moving along, let's talk postcards. A little disclaimer here, as I'm learning, more about vintage paper. I'm sharing information I'm getting from people who I believe to be experts in dealers. If you have different opinions or knowledge, please share them with us as this is just a learning forum. So I recently went to a postcard show. I think it was actually last month. I don't remember the date. It might have even been the end of October. And I simply went for to learn more about postcards since I love them and I use them in my journals. And a lot of times if you find an old postcard maybe that you don't like, you might collage off on the front and then write on the back and put it in a pocket. And I just wanted to learn more about um, about them in general. When I buy them um, from dealers or online, I don't understand why some of them are so much more expensive than others. So I thought if I could kind of figure that out, I could figure out how to get inexpensive ones for my journals and um, how to spot one when there is some inherent value to it. So the first thing I wanna talk about is, I think we all know these are Victorian postcards and usually we can tell that um, you know, by many things. One, this one happens to have a copyright of 1910 and is an identified um, the maker, but that doesn't often happen. But it's this kind of illustration with the raised embossed flowers and mixing flowers oftentimes with buildings and other things that kind of 
shows us it's Victorian. Um, also, in the back you can see the embossing. A lot of times if it was sent, there's a uh, postmark that you can um, discern the date, and in this case it says that it was um, 19, March 20th of 1912. So we can date that back to um, the end of Victor around the end of Victorian times. So these postcards, what I have learned is that um, the hand tinted ones are ones that we want to be very careful and preserve. Um, of the holidays, Easter is the most common and the least expensive. So if you are just looking for pretty botanicals and um, pretty images, Easter's the way to go for you. Uh, there's just so many that were made for Easter that it's, it's quite common that you can get them um, a good price for a retail price for a postcard, a Victorian postcard would be one to two dollars depending on the images. If there's a a lot of gilding on them, like a lot of gold, and it might be closer to two. And you want to make sure, now we don't really care about something being tatty, but as far as price goes, if you're working, if you're at a flea market or somewhere, and you see a Victorian postcard that has a bent corner, um, you want to bring that up to the dealer. But if it's missing a corner or has a rip, you call that a chip. And if it has a chip on it, it should be a dollar or two for a dollar. Um, I'm not sure how that translates in Europe, but definitely around here, um, even a Victorian card that's in not the greatest condition should be a dollar or less. Um, other holidays and other imagery is a lot more, Santa Clauses, um, anything with Christmas, Halloween. Halloween, you're going, you can pay up to $50 for a one of those cards. So. Uh, there's definitely different holidays that are rarer than others and the imagery is a very big part of that so you know if you're looking at a common card with flowers and animals and buildings that's very common you shouldn't feel guilty if you decide to cut it or put ribbon through it or something like that because as beautiful as they are and they are rare they're in the sense that you know you don't find them in stores anymore they're definitely something you could use as a supply. On the back, if it's plain, then definitely you could um, alter that. If there's writing and a postmark, you really don't want to destroy that. You never want to take off the um, stamp because those things all make the complete story of the postcard, when it was sent, who sent it, where it's from, and those things all add to the value. So if it's blank on the back and there isn't any postage, then it's not as valuable as one that was written on. So while some people collect things that have never been used, it is actually more collectible to um, have a postcard that has been used and has writing on it. So, you know, as, as paper crafters and people who love paper, uh, I probably, from this point on, will not alter anything that's been written on or has a stamp or a postmark. That doesn't mean I won't put it in a pocket or slide it in somewhere with a window, but I probably won't alter it. So these Victorian ones are something very common. Then we move on to um, a car cards that were considered, let's see, Here's another Victorian one. Now here's a good example of one that's in very poor condition. It has, it has a bend, if you can see, and it has a chip right there. Now it was written on, but there's no, um, there's no stamp. And it says, Dear Father, I am sorry your birthday came so soon, but I hope you enjoy it. Emily, this was his daughter. So it's a sweet little sentiment, so maybe you would want to keep that. But this is, if you found this at a flea market, this would be certainly one that you could alter. This should definitely not be more than 50 cents. Um, so, you know, this is a pretty image, and I would not feel bad cutting this and then using that and then using that. So something like this is definitely supply grade, and don't pay a lot of money for that. So now we're looking for, I'm looking for what's considered a linen card. Okay. So this is actually a fold out, and you've seen these before maybe where they open and the cards fold out. Right? This kind of coloring, this deep dye, coloring and the texture of the linen 
although this is paper, the outside is definitely a linen example of a linen, and I'm not going to be able to fold this up. Okay. Get that under there. Great. It's kind of hard. Let's see if I can get it. There is sort of this, there you go, you can see the texture. There's a linen texture, and um, these they just call linens, and sometimes they're printed you know, um, on like, you know, a machinery and sometimes they're printed black and white and then hand tinted. The hand tinted ones are older, usually around uh, 1900 to 1920, um, maybe even later, but you can tell the difference between the printing and the hand tinting ones. The hand tinting ones are, are worth more money. So these would be called linens and this, I forget what this is called. I think it's just called a folder postcard. Um, but for some reason, these don't seem very valuable to collectors, which is awesome for us because then we can cut a lot of the pieces out. They seem to like the individual cards more than the folders. So the folders might be a great thing for us as supplies because there's so many images for us to use. Okay, so now I'm going to go over to these. This one here does seem a bit hand tinted. You can tell because it's a little bit more, I don't know if it is, but it's just a little bit more subtle. And um, the subject matter also makes a difference with how much you pay for it. So in this case, this is um, Coney Island and the main entrance to Dreamland, which um, if any of you follow like vaudeville and back in the time of... Um, those types of shows on the boardwalk, this is kind of a, a special image. So, you know, definitely something that would be worth money. Also, when you see a famous building and then you see signs and other businesses around it, these are very, these are things we don't want to alter because they date and time. And not only do they date the time, but then there's also a historical piece of being able to see what businesses were around at that time. So knowing that now, when I find a postcard that's maybe a main street and it shows businesses, I, I'm not gonna alter that or destroy it in any way because I do understand the historical value of that now. So this one um, is 1911. So yes, close to, you know, like I said, early 1900s. So that's great. This one as well, very similar. You see people and there's um, a little writing down here. So this was all printed, but it almost does seem hand tinted or the original was hand tinted and then it was printed. But again, it's that same very um, kind of pastel color. And we, we really do um, want to keep things like this preserved. However, this is blank on the back. There's nothing saying you couldn't write on the back of this. So it definitely could be a journaling card. Okay, my son's gonna come in, so I'm gonna pause the video for a second and then we'll continue with our postcards. Okay, I'm back. This is another reason why I'm not making videos. I have a house full of people again. My son's home from college and my husband's off for the rest of the year and I'm getting no time at all to be alone and I'm a little shy making videos in front of them. So anyway, moving along. So we went over that we have linen uh, Victorian postcards, linen postcards, tinted postcards, and then there's something that's called a, let me see if I get this right, RPPC, an RPPC, which is a real photo postcard. And a real photo postcard is somewhat easy to tell what it is. It usually has a white border, not always. But it usually has a, a a lot of them have a white border. They look like a real picture, so they you know have that black and white. They're almost they are all black and white from what I've seen, um, at least the the ones that sell are. And um, usually there's like a white typing or handwritten um, identifier of what you're looking at. So this one isn't very very old. This is 1950, but it is a real. Um, a real photo postcard and for whatever reason any form of transportation and animals also make it a little bit more valuable and it says where it is it's route 12 in east swansea new hampshire that's not too far from me and it's the stagecoach 
obviously not the stagecoach in 1950, but maybe back in the day the stagecoach went through there. And it's, see, 1950, and um, it was, it looks like it was some kind of um, museum they went to. So this, you know, isn't valuable, valuable, not saying that you, you know, you could definitely alter it, but you know, if it is a real photo postcard, you might want to think twice. Here's an older one, and this is a good typical one. This one doesn't have the white border, but what is really neat about it is you can definitely tell it's a photograph. You can see a person, which it's always good when you can see people in it, and it says, well, it has an identifier over here of maybe who did it, because it can't be 1636. I'm not really sure what that, that means, but it just says Giant Santa Cruz, Giant Santa Cruz, big trees which I think we know are like what sequoia trees <laughs> and um, anyway it's it's black on the um, blank on the back so this would be a real photo postcard this definitely is it's glossy it's really not that great of a picture if you look at it it's a little bit blurry but the fact that you can see um, that this vintage bikes and the vintage dress and it has the person who took the picture down here that is a real photo postcard that for whatever reason people like to collect i'm not sure why i before learning about this probably would have passed this by as one i wouldn't have even picked up but now that we are dealing in um, selling some of the vintage things I know that this has a, a bit of inherent value, so I will definitely um, pick these up. So this is a, a real photo postcard. Now, here are two real photo postcards that are valuable for other reasons. It is a real photo postcard. It has people in it. But then the really interesting thing about it is it has the postage um, with that dates it and says where it came from here's the postage here which is good this happened to be two postcards sent together one and two and it's all in french and it's from 1919 so we're talking about during the war and um, the person sending it has written captions all over it um, identifying certain things in here in these pictures. So we have value for many reasons. We have value because it's a real picture for postcard. We have value because it shows streets and buildings which um, has historical significance. It is um, a value because we have the postage mark which will give us um, a date more it, it verifies the date of the card by the amount of postage and the postmark on it then we have what they wrote on the back which is all in French so until I can get this um, translated I won't be able to exactly um, know how valuable it is but I guess my point is I bought these because I just thought these were the most beautiful postcards and I wanted to do something with them journaling but I will now scan them and use copies of them because the inherent historical value of these cards I would never alter them for a journal so we've now learned about Victorian postcards linen postcards um, real picture postcards and I think that's a good little lesson for today so hopefully that gives you a little bit of uh, insight about when you're buying postcards if you're at an estate sale if you're at an auction um, as you're flipping through which ones are more valuable which ones would be good for supplies and which ones you might want to put aside and sort of keep for historical significance so hopefully that was some benefit to you ah, I'm really starting to appreciate postcards especially since books take up so much room so speaking of books here is my recommendation for this month I stumbled upon um, oh I just hit my camera. So I'm not sure in Europe if this is the same way. I'm, assure, I'm assuming around the world it is, but in the United States on Facebook, there's Facebook Marketplace. And when you start looking at certain things and, and saving bookmarks on certain things that you're interested in, it starts finding those things locally for you. There are a lot of vintage items that are being sold in Marketplace. 
and I ended up finding a person that was selling um, vintage books and he's actually a picker and now I have this wonderful connection and he's a super nice guy and um, actually that's where Sharon from Mad Paper Crush and I went when she got uh, stranded at my house for a couple of days which was so much fun anyway I digress so we went to his one of his storage units and I don't necessarily recommend going to a man's storage unit <laughs> but I felt very safe in this particular situation and he's a super nice guy but um I got one book from him that sort of, sort of tipped this whole thing off. Or maybe I didn't get it from him, but I saw it on his page, whatever. Anyway, it's called The Nature Library. And it's a set of books. And there's different publication publishing times of them, so they will look different. Um, you can kind of see these two were from the same year because they're the same coloring and this one is is green they're actually reversed this is green this is black this is black this is green so these are not all from the same um published publication year and they have on the binding this really beautiful scene outside with the deer and they're just really pretty books on the outside for journals as themselves um, let me see which one is the older this is the dark green one watch it be like Roman numerals or something and I can't decipher it da, 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 da. okay so 1917 was the original copyright this is the 1926 printing this is the dark green and then the light green is 1926 so this is 1909 1925 1926 which is really interesting maybe different volumes or different years so the 1926 is light green and what did I say the dark I already forgot what the dark green was 1926 huh that's really interesting if they both say 1926 and they have different colors well I can't explain that but I, I digress. I don't know how many um, volumes are in the Nature Library. I bought each one of these individually, but they all have the same thing in common. They all have a, a much, a very similar binding. And inside, that's not a very good copy. Although, let me teach you another little thing I've learned. This browning on paper, I used to think was mold or, or water damage, and sometimes it is, but they call that foxing. And foxing is when something acidic touches the page and stains it, and it usually comes with age. Um, foxing is not a bad thing. Foxing simply dates the book. Some people don't like foxing, but it's not inherently bad for the book. So this one is animals, and inside they have these beautiful color plates, and the animal is identified. And look at this beautiful title page. Isn't that gorgeous with the, the plate? And the, the, the artwork is really pretty. It's made by the Doubleday, Doubleday and Company, Garden City, New York. And then this is all animals. This is the animal volume. And look at it, it's, it's separated by the type of animal. This is carnivores. And it's print, but then you'll get the beautiful color plates. So there's a lot of good material in here. These would look beautiful on covers. Um, these would look beautiful inside as pages. If you folded it in half, they would be right side, they'd be the correct side up, which so many times it's the opposite for us when we fold them, the images are upside down. Um, they would be great to isolate different parts of it for tags and they're just really great plates really sweet images the colors are so vintage and, and neat and I don't know if it says how many plates are in there but there's just a ton so this is the animals and then I got trees which is lovely and shows the whole tree and then it shows the leaf and it shows the bud if it's a flowering tree so the, this is a pawpaw which I wish I had in my area because I'm a forager and we don't have pawpaw up here and a lot of people eat the pawpaw fruit. Wild black cherry. See, they're beautiful pictures with, again, the identifying leaf and flower. So this is trees. And this one, let's see, I'm getting closer and closer, is garden flowers. And again, these beautiful color images with the really nice um, flower and the, the title page 
which I just love. So again, this has the beautiful full plates. Isn't that gorgeous? Look at that. There's so many of them in here. And I have to say, you know, I, British books always have the most gorgeous images, but you know, these are the first American ones that I just really like from the early 19th century. And they really have that vintage look to them. So I found all three of these on Thrift Books. Right now, Thrift Books is having a sale. Um, I don't know if it's still going on, but I assume it is. Um, if you spend $20, they were having a, a product code. I think it was either 15 or 20% off. So I ordered these three, as well as a different book that I'll review a different time, um, for under $20. I think I got each one of these in the end. They had to be over $5 to get the discount, so they were all starting at over $5, but I think once I got the discount, they were all under $5. And again, um, when you order a certain amount, shipping is free, so I think I got each one of these books for under $5. And with the amount of plates in them, the beautiful binding, these are really a great value um, for journaling. So that's my recommendation. <sighs> Let me take a sip of coffee and touch base with you guys. I hope you guys are all doing something um, creative this holiday season and taking care of yourselves. I'm really enjoying Kaja Avery's um, advent calendar for those of you who are doing it. I hope you're enjoying it too. Um, for people who have aren't doing it, check it out. She is amazing every Christmas holiday season, even if you're not. Um, if you don't celebrate Christmas, you celebrate a different holiday during December. It's really not about the holiday. It's more about taking the month of December and really doing some meaningful creativity, taking some moments to yourself and, and sort of just breathing. Okay, so this is going to be so large, I don't think I'm going to be able to get it on camera. But I found this scrapbook. And I didn't get it for a song. I, I did buy it from a dealer, so I paid full price for it. It wasn't like I got it at an estate sale, but I'm okay with that because sometimes you see something and you just love it. And I, I really do think I can scan some of these things and maybe share them with you at some point. Look how gorgeous this cover is. And I've had to turn on my light because it's getting dark, but hopefully you can see that. So inside, it's all Victorian die cuts. Now, from what I've been told, if you wanted to remove these, all I had to do was soak this page in water and they will come off and be unharmed. Now, that really like scares the bejesus out of me, as they call it. That's probably not a nice thing to say, but it really does, it scares me. I'm thinking, how can I stick this in water and not have it get damaged? But that's what they tell me. If any of you out there have done that, please let me know if you've been successful because I don't want to take a hundred year old page and soak it and, and ruin it, especially with the price that I paid for this book. So this is full of die cuts and um, advertising images, calendars, and they have, look at this is horses. I think what I'd like to do, if I can take these off, is I'd like to keep a few for myself, and then I'd like to put some of these images in the shop. I don't think I'd keep the book as is because, you know, I just don't need all of these images, but they are lovely. Here's um, a postcard. Um, yes, I think it's a postcard. Of course, if I remove it, this is actually a... Um, advertisement so this is called a trade card so there might be some printing on the back of these I'd have to I'd have to see look at all that gold there and then there's some fall leaves I can't get the whole book in and this is all cats this is all dogs this is a a trade piece Look at this calendar, isn't this lovely? I don't know if you can see it, can you get it in? This is from 1909, so this is exactly 100 years old. Isn't that amazing? And there's like interesting things on the back of each page. Look at this sweet cat, I don't wanna hit the camera. Can I get it? Look at that kitty, meow. Okay, ooh, mushroom. 
Now this piece is damaged, but so interesting. Oops, sorry guys. It's a calendar, but it was a basket, and I guess it must have opened at some point. So I'd like to see if I can kind of recreate that. That would be a really neat um, digital if I can recreate that. There's a, some calling cards, some, some um, flowers. I have these really interesting guys here. I lost somebody's face and she's probably quite beautiful. Um, some more images here. There you go. Some of that really detailed Valentine's. Look at that. Um, some flowers. These are some really interesting Valentine's too for my sweetheart. Oh, I have low battery. Okay. I'm on low battery, so I guess I'm going to have to go really quick for the last part. So I was going to show you um, some of my polymer clay decorations, and maybe if you guys are interested, I will do some more tutorials on polymer clay at some point. These are just a few of my little guys that I made. If you guys are interested in learning more about polymer clay, let me know. I mean, I know this, I mostly do this for my journaling friends, but, you know, if there's an interest, I will be happy to do some classes. Okay, so last but not least, because I want to get to this. Okay, so I want to end because I think one of the things that we all enjoy so much about the paper community is our correspondence with each other and our friendships that we have um, made. In January, we'll start introducing you to Emily, who is the main person um, that curated most of the paper that Diane and I purchased for Tape and Twine Vintage. And Emily had a pen pal uh, in France, and they were pen pals as children through World War I. This was a little bit later on. This is in um, 1920, so almost 100 years ago. And I wanted to read you a couple of letters that were written around Christmas time, just to sort of give you an idea of how um, people wrote to each other back then and what they might say in a Christmas letter to each other. So this is from Suzanne. Suzanne is the pen pal in France. And um, this was sent, I believe, December 6th. And this is another thing I found with these letters. A lot of times it's an eight and a half by 11 that's folded. And they start down here on the bottom of the crease, open it up, they come to the right hand page, then they turn it and write, and then they end on the back. So I thought, I always find that so fascinating, but so many of Emily's letters from all over um, are exactly that way, so that must have been the standard for letters. So I'm just gonna read this to you. December 5th, my dearest friend, just as I was receiving your letter, I was doing a little package for your Christmas. I make great wishes for it, comes not broken in your hands. Um, Suzanne was French and French speaking, so her translations are sometimes a little bit clumsy because translations are like that. And when I translate hers, you're gonna see how clumsy I am, so um, you'll just have to sort of read between the lines. So she says, I make great wishes for it to come not broken in your hands. It's a flower made with coquillages. I don't know if I said that right. I think it seems shell, but I am not sure. And that makes sense because people did collect shells and make them into brooches and flowers. To put on your belt when you go dancing, it is the great fashion this year. So in France, it was fashionable to have shell um, brooches or flowers on your belt. I hope it will make you great pleasure. We are now in winter, but the weather has not been too cold. Only I think it says pre, uh, pleasant or previous. The Delphinium Society must be very interesting. So I have now, I have learned that Emily was a part of the Delphinium Club, which I didn't 
this is, shows you how little I know. I thought delphiniums were flowers, so I thought it was like a garden club, but when I looked into it, it was like a society for women to actually learn about things. Um, sort of the first, I wouldn't say feminist, but the first t type of groups where women wanted to expand their knowledge of the world and how to assert themselves, how to learn about interesting things, how to become a community within themselves. And she was a, a, a big part of her local Delphinium club, so she must, or society, so she must have told Suzanne that, because Suzanne writes, the Delphinium society must be very interesting. It did not exist in France, but now something nearly the same is in preparation with a large program. Women of all categories will be assembled to discuss of all questions being necessary to the prosperity of France. Questions of nativity, hygiene, of work, of education, etc. But it is only in preparations at this time. Dearest Emily, and then here she talks all in French because Emily was trying to learn French um, in the early letters and now I think in the later um, letters she would actually write a chunk in French so I went through Google Translate so it's going to be very awkward but this is basically what the end of her letter says to Emily I am just telling you otherwise I hope you're going to have a nice Christmas time I love you honey and a thousand pleasures for love that lives a thousand kiss of your loving friend who is happy to see you and see you soon in a long letter which I think is very sweet. And they were very, very, um, very, very familiar and loving to each other in their letters. And they wrote like every week or every other week. So this was December 6th. And then this is the last letter of 1920 that Emily received from Suzanne. So I wanted to read this one too. It's a little short, but it's sweet. She wrote it on December 16th, but Suzanne received it. I mean, um, Emily received it on December 31st. Dearest Emily, I first shall wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. I hope that all your wills will be satisfied and your health always good. I have seen you by your last letter that you were very much busy, but that you enjoyed yourselves a great deal too. I have been at two or three parties these last days, but they were certainly not as amusing as yours. The weather is very cold because of the northern wind, and last week we have had snow. It is rare in Cherbourg. Cherbourg to boys and girls were extremely joyous. I know that in the U.S. there are many snowy days. I don't know anything else to write, so to close I'm sending again my best wishes of happiness, best kisses of your friend, Suzanne. So as I close out this letter, I just want to wish all of you a happy holiday, no matter what you celebrate. And thank you for making this year such a special one for me, for all the new friendships that I've made, all the knowledge that I've learned. And just thank you for being a part of that. I really look forward to um, a really creative and wonderful 2020. If you're a subscriber of mine and have been subscribed to me for a while, I just thank you so much for supporting me. And if you're new, welcome and thank you so much for joining us. I really hope that next year I can expand um, the community that I'm in right now, that I can make more friends, more connections, and I can share just a little bit of kindness and happiness like Suzanne and Emily did um, with each other. So Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, um, all the other holidays that I might not include, but my heart wishes you the best, and I will see you next year. Bye.